Kreutzer and welcome to Tales for Wales, the pod that never fails to shine a light on that little uncovered corner of history and to make sure you leave the pod knowing a little something something you didn't know before. It's a little bit of something, fit behind your ears. It's a little you know what I mean mate, it's a little I haven't even got the, the we'll, fake energy to pretend I know, I'm yeah, happy I can tell you're deflated because that <laughs> always perks you back up, that stupid little accent we do, so yeah. you can tell you're stressed out. Yeah, I've had a rotten day in work and it's, uh, it's, uh, uh what's quite funny is, um, I've been finding myself getting a bit angry recently or a bit like sh- short temp, not short tempered, just like rage. <laughs> like there's an actual rage inside of me. <laughs> not short tempered, how do I say it? Like just pure and adulterated rage. <laughs> yeah. So I bought this, um, stress monkey from amazon it's a right. big stretch <sighs> um it's like this stress monkey which you can like squeeze and fucking strangle um <laughs> you beat but, the shit out of well it. I, on, on not, i'm not joking my second time using it i ripped it and it burst everywhere which made me so angry because it was full of sand i was just saying make you even more <laughs> not eat then <laughs> it's just doing the opposite of what uh, it's meant to do it was like full of fucking like chemically like altered sand i thought well this can't be good to be in the oh, atmosphere so now you're gonna have to get on your hands and yeah knees did and I got clean fucking, it up yeah so then i bought a, a, a second one um and also mm. i have to send it back to get my refund and i just have to send but it says oh you don't need to put it in a box you can just send it back i don't know how that works but it's just a like a <laughs> yeah. like a uh, an empty gorilla and it just looks fucking mad like this rubbery like flopping about ripped in half gorilla so i am this is gonna it. is this like a precursor to something i should be worried about like in a couple of weeks you're gonna go i had this dream and i was strangling my stress monkey and i woke <laughs> up and it was emma i had emma yeah, <laughs> yeah no i um i did then buy some uh, stress balls because there's nothing online that is like because like I, I I want a punching bag, but I don't. I can't put a heavy enough one in the flat because the other ones are fucking feeble. They they I used to have one as a kid or like when I was younger, and they can come off quite easily. And my my gym's closed down, so I don't have a punching bag in the gym anymore. Especially with you, mate. You're hardest fucking. I'm fucking you, rocky, so you, you you exactly. You need to get the hardest reinforced. You're something fucking pretty fighters. heavy duty for me, mate. All right, <laughs> yeah. trust oh, that ain't gonna cover it. Listen, mate. But even when I was like 15, <laughs> they used to I, I used to have this one on like a on a bit of metal that had a ball on top, but they're fucking they they do just fly off. So I was like, um all right, let's see what online is there. It's a good thing just to like just to go and squeeze and smash and punch or whatever. And uh I f- uh I got these stress balls instead. Um so these stress balls and what are they off. just like squeezy things, are they? Yeah, but they have like um sayings on them. They're like they're they're not just um <laughs> Yeah. They're they're like uh what's it called? Like a uh, the things you say into the atmosphere to try and feel better about yourself, like um, you know, oh, what, what those. So you're not just squeezing; you're learning as but, well. But do you know what I mean? That there's affirmations. I think they're called. So you, you'll say these things like, "I will be a pretty boy," and then you will become a pretty boy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hope that is one of them. Squeezing <laughs> yeah. it, you will be a pretty boy. I will yeah. be. Uh, but they have all these things on there, like. Uh, um, uh, you've got this. Remember to smile. Kindness is key. And I'm just like, fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, squeezing the shit out of it. Yeah. Um, oh dear me. So yeah, the, yeah. Just um, it's been a fucking tough day in work, and I've got a fucking. So the re- mm. we've had to do a few of these quite quickly because I'm had the wedding, and now I'm off to London, then off to Germany for like ten days. So it's just been fucking much, and I got cunty clients who are being fucking rat cunts. How are you? You want to be squeezing them, don't you? Yeah, I do. I, I sent a voice yeah. note to my friend saying, oh, um, mm. oh mate, um, I just thought I'd... No, what, what was it? It was... Um, um, oh, it was the guy, the client, Spanish as well, and my, my mm. client's uh, English. Went, you fucking think the football's bad, right, mate? I got this <laughs> fucking can who keeps fucking messaging yeah. me about fucking LinkedIn! <laughs> and <I keep> fucking, <laughs> like, screaming down the mouth. Fucking you know. hell. <laughs> Oh, uh, and it does. Oh, it, uh, it's, I do yeah. find because I, I think really it's really stress things. Yeah, go on. Oh, it's gonna say no. Go on. With being more grouchy, I was like, um, and then doing the voice notes made me really laugh because I was going, "Oh, hey, you wee bastard! I, I, I'd help these <laughs> uh, uh, the banners you're asking. Don't accidentally choke you, you wee Spanish prick. <laughs> you wee bastard. <laughs> yeah, and then we just, and then I realised it's all about how you position yourself. If you want to have a laugh, just have a laugh. If things go wrong, mm. nothing's going to go even wrong if you just have a laugh about it. So, did you? Uh, is that one of funny your stress balls? Is that <laughs> one? You squeeze one of them out. It goes. Look, just position yourself right. If you want to yeah. have a laugh, have yeah. a laugh. Right. Yeah. So that's. I um, always find with stuff like that. Like 
you know when you you're stressed and you're like you're overtopping like with your emotions yeah. like that you know like all the like sensible solutions are so shit go yeah. for a walk yeah. have a run you know <laughs> yeah. it's like i don't want to go out and have a fucking no, run <laughs> punch the shit into something that's yeah. a lot better i get my the thing that overtops me the most as you know full well is Tech. When things don't work as they're meant to, yeah, normally tech. <laughs> tech. Or when I'm doing like flat pack shit, like yeah. either furniture or shelves, or whatever. Because oh, Christ, this one time I was trying to hang a shelf up in in this room actually I'm in now, and I put it up and I held it with one hand and I had to get a screwdriver with the other hand. And when I held it, it like it wasn't even hard or anything, but it just like fell on my head a little bit and like sort of gave me a little. <laughs> it was the tiniest knot. Oh, right? that would. I me. was so ready to just <laughs> smash that thing to shit. Amy was downstairs. You just hear me going, "Oh for fuck's sake!" And like <laughs> it's so hard not for me to just absolutely smash it to bits. Yeah, and, I, um, I, Amy I, just knows now because if she comes up and goes, "You all right?" Yeah, it's yeah, like, "Cause I'm all right." Annoying. It's like, yeah. just leave me to it. Yeah, yeah, just let me be annoyed and a child for fucking five minutes. Then I'll be <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, oh, I was gonna say I don't know if I can, can quite remember how they said it, but um, um, you bet your yeah, that was it. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> I was walking past, and town's been really busy. As the, the bay's been really busy because it's graduation. Um, oh, and right. there was like a a a daughter getting her graduation on, and then the daughter's like boyfriend, and then <laughs> getting the dad. her graduation on. Great <laughs> yeah. it. Getting my graduation on. Um, <laughs> And, and then the the, the dad and the, the, not like the daughter and the boyfriend were arguing, and they were like like trying to hold it together. And the dad went, mm. "Oh, you met your match, ain't ya? You met your match." <laughs> <laughs> and he was loving it. He was like, "How? Oh, you met your match, haven't ya?" He kept saying that really <laughs> loudly. Between his daughter, and yeah. Her partner, yeah. And, and you could see she was looking fucking furious. She was like, "Shut up!" And she was even more annoyed at the the boyfriend for like. I don't, I don't know what it was. I obviously couldn't get too far into it. Ah, oh, you met your match. <laughs> I've been thinking about that. So <laughs> that. there's something about like cockneys, like cockney dads who just like, mm. it just, <laughs> this is meant to be like her day. <laughs> she can't help but make it like argumentative <laughs> yeah. or a wind up merchant. Oh, yeah, you met your really. match. Make your match, and you yeah. you'll be in the dog house tonight. What you mate? Oh. And I keep saying it to people now. So I asked Fletch, my mate drove me to football last <laughs> night, and I was like, um, it, and he said, "Oh yeah, we're having tofu for tea." And I hate it when Rihanna makes tofu. And I was like, ah, "You met your match. You met your match." <laughs> 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 it's become my new little catchphrase to say. Applicable to everything. Yeah, yeah all six Brilliant. shoes. Yeah. Oh, um, well, I right. hope I hope this that's the end of the stress for you, mate. Today, hopefully, yeah, the, it won't the balls be. will do their job. No, yeah, um, it, it won't be. But you know, we live and learn. Um, sorry, if you hear emails coming through, I'm trying to make it silent, but I don't know how. So sorry if you hear. Oh, I can't hear anything. Yeah, you might hear good. Record. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. All right. Um, well, we should do shout. But to be honest, I'm in no mood to be happy. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we and this is quite a rush once it's lunchtime. We're trying to fit a lot in. So yeah, uh, we'll carry on with the Patreon shout because we got some. Uh, people, you know, we, we keep getting people signed up and we definitely want to thank them because we are a uh, listener sponsored podcast. So this is all done thanks to our uh, Patreon members. And you can get involved. Yeah, we'll save um, the next shout out for when we're in a perkier mood. Yes, is it? And yeah, we can do our yeah, usual yeah, they deserve better than this. Foibles yeah. doing it, yeah. Yeah, um, exactly. Patreon.com forward slash Tales for Wales. I think it's all written out, isn't it? Yeah, all the words. All the words, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so. <sighs> and breathe. <laughs> yeah. And breathe, yes. Um Well, I'm gonna do today's episode, which probably isn't for the best, but um I- I'm gonna focus on the well this is the tagline that I read, which was the most important Welshman you've never heard of. Um and I'd like to start by saying this episode was suggested during an Instagram shout out, and I'm really sorry but I can't mm. remember I can't find who it was who suggested it because it doesn't say their names and it's been too long now. So I made a list of them all and I put them on our like uh, highlights reel, but it doesn't say who sent them in, so do apologize. But someone suggested Abdul Rahim Abi Farah. Um so thank you, Secret Contributor, for this because it's a really interesting one. Um and also I think mm. yeah, like I said then, we we're gonna go back to um shouting out we've got like Jana Banana and people like that shout on the Patreon. We'll do them next week. Scouts on her. All right. Yeah, you'll you'll get yeah, you'll get a proper you'll shout get out. Your yeah. dues. Um now, uh now we know so this is all about uh a little place me and you know called Barry. And, uh, 
And we know that Barry is a hub that will nurture the very best and the very brightest Wales has to offer. Um, so true. former Pride Cymru leader Gwynvod Evans was named the fourth most important Welshman. He was from there. Uh, Julia Eileen Gillard. Do you remember that her? She was the first and only female Australian Prime Minister. And when she came into oh, really? office... Yeah. Yeah, I remember when she came into office, everyone was like, everyone from Barry was like, fuck, this is, she's like a Barry girl. I don't think she, I think she was just born there, but her family, the Gillards, have been around in Penarth and Barry and stuff for years. So they're quite a well known family. I didn't realise she was um, was Welsh. Well, originally Welsh, I guess, born Welsh. Well, what about this one? Derek Clifford Brockway, the Welsh meteorologist. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, Barry. Uh, I thought he'd be more impressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, The great stand up Mike Bubbins, he's from Barry. Yeah, of course. Classic. And dare I say, your humble host, we were educated and groomed into the slick broadcasters <laughs> that we are. Uh, I said broadcasters. I meant to say podcasters, but I yeah. <laughs> even got that wrong. I was, I was waiting for you to name drop us then as well. I was yeah. like, surely he's not going to miss this opportunity. No. So yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad yeah. we made the list. Uh, however, and what's becoming a bit of a fine tradition for this humble little pod, um, we want to shine a light on the otherwise dimly lit person of our past. And today we're going to discuss Abdul Rahim Barry Farah, who's dubbed the most important Welshman you've never heard of. Um, and a lot of what I've learned has come from an obituary in The Guardian from his nephew and then A&A Nation Cymru article by Ian Johnson. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Best place to start, if you ask me. Best place to do it. I've got a fucking blinding headache now as well. So <laughs> got, I've got fucking, a stress migraine, all right? I've got a stress migraine. A little stress. I've got, I haven't had a sip to drink all day. Uh, I just didn't like any liquid. I've got the remnants of last night's Pepsi Max. <laughs> just <laughs> just swilling around your yeah. system, yeah. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I'll start at the beginning because it'd be fucking mad if I did like a memento style episode. If you started <laughs> anywhere else, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but just drip through the different time periods and not tell <laughs> it. would be a hell of a day for you to start messing with the narrative <laughs> tradition, wouldn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wake up with tattoos. It would be calm if you're going to be doing tattoos. something like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I won't do that. Um, um, so, uh, yes, instead, I'm just going to do it normally. <laughs> I don't know why I made such a big deal about this. <laughs> uh, so, Farrow was born in October 1919. And I, why is that date significant, Kaji? Oh, it's because that was the date of the race riots of Correct. Cardiff, Barry, and. Is it Newport? Newport. Yeah, Newport. Newport. Um, which we covered in last week's episode. Um, mm-hmm. He was born only weeks after the murder of the Chilean sailor Jose Martinez uh, on a neighbouring street to Thompson, um, to Thompson Street where Farrow had been raised. So, it, this is where he was born in this area. This is where the height of the, the riots were. Uh, and it shows that the tensions, the tensions in that area were still really high throughout the rest of the year. Um, and his family were quite pivotal in the community. So he'd been very much aware that where he's come from has been a, a site of quite intense uh, racial tension. Um, his mother, Hilda Anderson, she ran a boarding house while his Somali father, Abby Farah, was a sailor and entrepreneur. Um, mm-hmm. He attended Gladstone Primary School and Barry County Grammar School. Well, his parents were amongst a group of uh, who founded the multiracial Domino's Club on Thompson Street. And his father was a member of the Thompson Street Colonial Club Committee and was awarded an MBE for his wartime support for international sailors. Mm. So like his family, the community then, his family, yeah, definitely. Yeah, they're, they're part of they're part of the reason why there's a very close knit, but very welcoming community of mixed ethnicities in the area. Mm. Um, but sadly, most of that street was later raised in clearances of the Barry Docks area running south of Holton Road, which is now less famous and less romanticised uh, version of, of Tiger Bay. So there is like a similar Tiger Bay down in Barry, but it's not really as oh, yeah. uh, well known. Yeah. Um, at 17, Farrow was sent to Hergesia in British, uh, I might have said that wrong, but soz, uh, in British Somaliland, where he became a clerk and then a magistrate for the British colonial services, fighting in World War Two as a commando for the British forces in East Africa. Yeah. So he's a he's clever tough bastard as well. Tough and clever. Uh, after the war, he graduated from Exeter in Oxford in civic administration before returning to the Horn of Africa, where he spent the 1950s working in the trust territory of Somaliland, the Italian administered territories, which uh, had Mogadishu as its capital. Mm. Um, and it's mad. This is when like Africa still has lots of ties with its colonial past, and lots of these countries like Italy, Denmark, the Dutch, the British, 
the French still had heavily administrated territories there whilst these countries were finding their own independence. So okay. um, the independent Somali Republic in 1960 was then formed by the, two, by the merger of two British and Italian uh, protectories. So British Somaliland in the north, understandably the region, which is the closest links to, the, to Wales. So um, yeah. that's where uh, Farah went to go. And he was trying to, he was help, help in the early days of the Somali, Somali Republic. Um, so this lad had gone from Barry to Somaliland to East Africa to Exeter and Oxford and then back to Africa. So he had that, uh, you know, those like fucking tedious rich kids when they go on a gap year, they say, oh, I've got the, I've got the bug. I've got the oh, travel yeah. bug. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but in 1961, then Farah became the Somali ambassador to Ethiopia, uh, then under the ruler, uh, the emperor of Hale Selassie. And this is perhaps the biggest role for a Somali diplomat. So, um, this is like a really on like it's a huge honor for him time, to be given yeah. this, yeah. Um, but there was ongoing uh, the, with the, with the Somali neighbors, there was ongoing uh, border disputes over the Ogaden region, considered to be part of Greater Somalia. So it was on him to represent this new country at the Organization of Africa Un- uh, African Unity okay. and at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. So he had to go yeah. and represent Somali whilst it was still kind of. Uh, it, 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 whilst in like Ethiopia and the countries around there, there was still lots of tension, and he had to use a lot of like diplomacy to try and mm. ease uh, any like heavy escalation. Um, had to be deft, a, a deft hand at the old politics. Yeah, and in 1965, he became the permanent representative of Somalia to the United Nations, a post he held until 1972. Um, and during that era, he served as acting director of Somali's foreign, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And in 1969, he became chair of the recently formed UN Special Committee on Apartheid. Um, so he was a part of this huge uh, resolution that the um, UN has started to try and get rid of apartheid, which is, you know, the separation of blacks and whites mm. in Africa and in other countries, I think. But apartheid is really well known in Africa because of there was like a... Um, two citizenships there um not not slavery but there was places where black people couldn't go couldn't hold jobs could be imprisoned much easier than white people yeah. you, you know i'm sure everyone here knows about apartheid yeah yeah um but he'd been selected to form and chair this committee that was focusing on how to get how to erode the segregation and apartheid um What's really oh, yeah. sad is many Western countries didn't participate in the committee's early years because they didn't want to support uh, an economic boycott of South Africa and because it didn't benefit them. Um, so they were like, well, this isn't going to help us by boycotting there. We still have trade and stuff like that. So they just left the fight. They thought, um, yeah, they, that's a bit shit, isn't it? Yeah. So even though South Africa like was, you know, this is like modern times, they were still like very openly uh, had such prominent racism and uh, like apartheid but yeah loads of western countries are like listen this ain't to do with this we're going to carry on our business um but you sex do, that, you, don't know when it's yeah. like putting the um the the yankee dollar ahead of actually just doing the right thing yeah it's, just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's that sucks. classic thing of like western countries happily watching on as discrimination and like brutal regimes take place on innocent people if it meant they can continue their trade which is like you know something yeah. you fucking see all the time now um but then quite drastically somalia went under went a regime change from 1969 and Mohammed Saeed Barra's revolution declared Somalia a socialist state and it appears then that Farah who was linked with the previously elected Somalia Youth League took a back seat in terms of Somali domestic politics um, which okay. which is uh, might show why because now he's no longer so heavily involved in Somalia politics what happens next is uh, Barra led Somalia to a disastrous war with Ethiopia in 1977 and 78 and and had uh, Farah still been the envoy to Ethiopia, you know, he probably would have advised against that. Um, so this disastrous war happened in 1977-78. And then in 1980, civil war and an attempted genocide brought about the 1999-1991 Somaliland Declaration for Independence for the North, so the former British colony. So um, well, whilst Farah was there helping out a lot more, things were on a steady upward tick. And then uh, when this uh, Mohammed Sayed yeah. revolution happened... It all went tits right up. It all went tits up. Um, since that time, Somaliland is self-governed, whilst the remainder of Somalia is frequently dis- described as a failed state lacking in democracy and governance. <laughs> so with this time in Somalia now over, before the catastrophic reign of uh, Barra, Farah continued his work elsewhere. And he's accredited with arranging the very first UN's meeting in uh, Africa. So he, he, he arranged... Oh, right, yeah. um, 
in Ethiopia's capital, Addis uh, Abba, in 1972, because usually they always take place in New York. Um, it, when the UN meeting was first set up and the UN's headquarters was set up, it was in 1952, and they're always held in New York. And this is like the first time ever that it's left New York to go to Africa of all countries, which is like... So he must have had know, quite a big pull then. He's obviously got, you know... Um, yeah, he's his, like, his word carries weight, doesn't it? Yeah, so it's amazing. It's carried up and Barry managed to move one of the world's biggest influential organizations to come to Ethiopia. Mm. Um, and then he was president of a six-day UN Security Council meeting on questions relating to Africa alongside um, a person called Umar Arte Galib, uh, with votes taken on resolutions about independence for things like Nambia, criticism of South Africa's apartheid regime, and then the ongoing repression in Portuguese territories. So like, he's doing so much for a whole continent. It's not like he's yeah. just doing... Uh, so he really was like a massive champion of African affairs and for the African people. Um, and then writing in 1974 on apartheid, he said, the existence of the government of South Africa's apartheid policies, which is racism in its most extreme form, is a challenge of the same moral order of, of slavery in the 18th century or Nazi persecution of the Jews in the 20th century. And this is coming from a diplomat. And to be fair, something like yeah. some things need tact and delicate wording, and but something as abhorrent as apartheid needs less flowery language. And this is what his statement was. It was a really, uh, you know, it was calling out things what they are. Similarly to yeah. how you could see things going on in Palestine right now, it's like there's it, the, it would yeah, take no someone important. Yeah, no words and dancing yeah, no around the subject. Words, is it? You got to be pretty direct. Situation's awful. And uh, this is this was coming from yeah 1974, where right now when you look back with our goggles on you say well how could they ever have apartheid but this is our government we're like yeah we can we can stomach apartheid and yeah. this is him speaking on behalf um, of a continent uh, and, and uh, on behalf of people uh, just calling it out for what it was it's as big as a moral issue as slavery in the 18th century or nazi persecution apartheid's up there with them yeah. um so back in New York, Farah continued to work within the United Nations, becoming the first Assistant Secretary General for the Special Political Questions between 1973 and 1978, before becoming the Under Secretary General from 1979 to 1990. So our lad, in 1990, Farah had led UN missions on progress made on the Declaration of Apartheid and its destructive consequences on South Africa. Uh, effectively, it was part of dismantling South Africa's apartheid state. Uh, meeting an ex-con named Nelson Mandela, uh, who'd recently finished mm. his old bit of porridge. Um, yeah. And he was working with South African President F.W.D. Clerk uh, and nicely completing the work of several decades of uh, international pressure. So he, he was a part of the team there who was instrumental in the collapse of the apartheid. Um, and then in his so-called retirement, uh, Farah helped to start the Partnership to Strengthen African Grassroots Organizations. So that's the name of it. It's not, not the most catchy, but it goes by PASCO, <laughs> uh, which he chaired. And he established a hospital for landmine victims in Somalia, which has been incredibly uh, praised for how effective it's been. Um, but then he died in 2018, 3,332 miles away from his home in Barry at the ripe old age of 98. Um, oh, great innings. And I'd like to read a quote from Ian Johnson from Nation Cymru, who said in his article, uh, in writing this brief biography, I make no claim to be an expert on Abdul Rahim Abi Farah. If I've misunderstood or misinterpreted his aims, goals, or beliefs, I apologize. And I'm happy to be corrected so that our understanding of him can be improved. But that is perhaps my point. How is a man who clearly achieved so much in the world remains so unknown in the country which he's born? And I thought, that's such a valid point for like, yeah, we 100%. don't, there's, you know, there's, there's not like a plaque of him. There's not sort of like, like a statue of him. There's a man who was chief worked so hard to change so much of the African continent. And we don't really know anything, but like even in our schools, yeah, they didn't even teach us anything. Force about the first. For, for good in the world. And yeah. yeah not, not, not nearly a mention in the classroom. I think he's the first and only Welsh person to be a part of the UN's uh, council and stuff like that. And just, just, yeah, it's it's yeah, a shame really that big these time things we, don't... You don't hear anything about it, isn't it? But no. that's what we're here for. Mate. That's what that's we're, what we're here, here for. for. Picking up the little lid. Um, mm. So yes, that's it. Was a, it's a short one because there wasn't there wasn't. I didn't want to go too much into policy and all the the, the things that might be a little bit heavy um, or mm. a bit dry. Save but... the uh, political stuff for when we're hammered, mate, and we go off on <laughs> ten minute tangents. <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I could have gone more into some of his policies, but it's just all about it's you know that's not the most interesting. I think the important thing is he was being this champion where others weren't, and he didn't have to. He could have stayed in the UK. You know, he, he actively chose to to go off and try his best to change. Could have chilled out in Barry, going down Barry yeah. Island Pleasure Park every day, having a laugh. Up the park for a few to make... Yeah, exactly. But down, down the Acropolis down there. Yeah. But he, um, yeah, no, he decided to 
pull up his bootstraps and go do some good in the world. Fair play to him. Get on your bike, mate. <laughs> yeah. That's what Tories always say when this, people say they can't find a job, don't they? Get on your bike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or right. I'm, wor- I'm working two jobs I can't afford rent. Yeah. Well, fucking work bike. a third one then. Pull your boot, your put yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. yeah. We said we weren't going to get political, but it's impossible. Oh, there we are. Can't help it. Can't uh, help it. Dead short one, but fucking soz. Um, uh, I haven't got any. me. I'm. If you got this far, please, for my own mental health, leave a nice review and drop some five stars because <laughs> yeah. you know this could be the end you ever hear of old Frankel. If you got, if you know any good like stress ball outlets or stress <laughs> yes, monkey sales, yeah. then link them yeah, to us because Frank will really appreciate it. Yeah, we can get some merch, some uh, stress ball merch on the go. Absolutely, uh, man. Well, cheers, mate. It was really good. Cheers, mate. Well, dear Grandad, catch you all soon. Yeah, dear. Ta-da now. Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da.